All right, welcome everyone to tonight's class on drawing 3D forms using value shapes. I know the official class title is much longer than that, but that's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, we're going to be using some pen and ink tonight to add uh, value or uh, dark and light. Uh, value is shading, so the dark and light shadows that we are seeing on a form to these images that we started in last week's class on uh, uh, using contour lines. And you can view last week's class on YouTube or on the Michaels website archived under Fine Arts if you missed it. And uh, I just wanna talk about one class that we have coming up uh, in this series. So it's actually two classes. So tonight's class is very much a, um, we're, we're revisiting a core skill that we covered early on in the series. We've been doing these classes for uh, over two years now, and a lot of you are regular, so you, you know, and you've been joining us for a long time. But for those of you who are just joining us, we started this in uh, July 2021, um, or I did, started teaching these classes for Michael's same time, Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time. So, um, we always hold them at this time, and then the, the free classes are put up on YouTube the next day. Anyway, in the early uh, stages of this series, I was really covering a lot of very beginning drawing skills, and then since then I've been uh, really, you know, continuing to, to use those skills, but this is the first time in over two years that I'm calling back to some of those original skills and breaking them down uh, again in a little bit different way. So last week we did that, we revisited one of the very first skills that we covered, which was uh, using contour lines to draw three-dimensional forms, turning a 2D shape into a 3D uh, form. Uh, using those contour lines, and we used an image, this image of a lime from multiple directions. And then tonight we're going to be doing the, uh, using the same images of the lime, and we're going to be adding the pen and ink shading techniques to those using hatching, cross hatching, stippling, and scribbling, which, which are four uh, shading techniques that you can do with any uh, drawing material, but they're used a lot with pen and ink. So over the course of the next two weeks, we'll be building on that. Since we're using those shading techniques tonight, we're going to really get into some pen and ink work. And uh, we're going to be creating this moonscape using uh, pen and ink and some liquid ink. So we'll be pulling in some paintbrushes and some black Sumi ink and then some Liquitex uh, yellow oxide ink here too. And then also using Faber-Castell pens. Uh, but you can use any waterproof pen for, for this supply link. And uh, I did notice, um, I might update it on the, the Michaels website if I can before uh, this class starts, that that Sumi ink that I linked was showing as out of stock on the Michaels website. Any black ink that you can find, find will work great. So if you've got some Higgins Black India ink, some Windsor & Newton Black India ink, um, or any you know black waterproof ink that you have, but I noticed those were two other brands that I, I saw in Michaels when I was in this one of the stores here in Austin recently. So um, that's all you need for that class is some liquid ink and uh, some waterproof pens like Micron's, Faber Castell, Artist Loft illustration pens are all waterproof, and then you could use some yellow watercolor or some yellow uh, acrylic paint. Although you might want a couple of um, different colors of yellow because we're going to be using this kind of okra uh, yellow oxide color to be adding this like very fall leaf. So anyway, that's what we'll be doing for the next two weeks. It's a two part class. Uh, make sure you sign up for that. It's free and you don't want to miss it. And tonight's class is really using a lot of skills that we can build on for uh, those two upcoming classes. So I'm going to switch to my tabletop view and go over supplies and we'll get started here. Uh, so don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michaels or Michaels classes and follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Um, and then here are some of my business cards with some of my work using, I use a lot of ink in my work, a lot of calligraphy ink to make a lot of different types of paintings. 
So there's that. Um, and then this is the drawing that we started last week and we'll be building on top of that uh, for tonight's class. And we're using the Tombow, let me make sure I was like, should have looked up the pronunciation of uh, these pens uh, earlier. They're brush pens, but it, they say Furunosuke. I think that's right. I'm like saying it really fast, that Japanese word. Uh, so they come in a package of two and they do say they are water-based. Um, I've never tried adding water to these. I'm pretty sure they are not waterproof. So these would not necessarily be the pens to use for uh, next week's class since we're gonna want something uh, waterproof for these. And I did not put these on the supply list for next week's classes, but I just wanted to mention that. Uh, I really just love these pens and I really enjoy drawing with them. And they come with a hard tip and a soft tip. And that's what we're using tonight. And then I've got the Canson drawing pad here also from Michaels of course and then uh, you might want an eraser so that you can a synthetic eraser so that you can erase your pencil lines underneath uh, the sketch or you can just leave them there they might look kind of cool and then we've got these reference photos that I provided for you of the lime uh, in four different uh, from four different views. So we've got one, two, three, four photos of the lime that should have been included on the supply list. All right, so we're just going to dive in and get started here. You're going to want a little bit of scratch paper off to the side. So that's why I pulled out this second uh, sketchbook here. So I'm going to be working on the drawing from last week, but we're going to do uh, a little bit of just talking about these uh, shading techniques and uh, the value scale. So uh, you can draw do this in pencil first if you'd like as well, but I'm just gonna jump right to pen here. So we're gonna draw some long skinny rectangles. We're gonna draw four of them. And we're going to label them with our four shading techniques that we're using tonight. Get my fourth one drawn here real quick. All right, so we've got hatching, cross hatching, Stippling, and then scribbling, or we could say random mark, because it could be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a scribble. It could be the letter E repeated over and over again. All right, so hatching is one directional lines that follow the three-dimensional form. And here's an example of hatching. We're about to do it on one of our limes here. So just want to talk really quickly about the value scale for all of these. So value is the word of the night. All right, so we're gonna put a zero and a 10 on the end of all of these little value scales here. So we've got a value scale from zero to 10, zero being your blank paper. And 10 being your absolute black. Pardon my left-handedness covering up my, my writing here. All right, so we've got one directional lines for hatching. We're just doing a little practice value scale here. So it doesn't matter which direction you put these lines in the value scale, but let's do those however we do them. We're gonna overlap them. 
So I've got vertical lines. We're going to overlap them until we get to a solid black, no paper showing through. So that's our 10 on the value scale. And your value scale does not have to be perfect. It's okay if it goes outside of the lines a little bit here. All right. And then even though we've got a pen, we can definitely still put a different amount of pressure on our pen and get a different kind of thickness of line to happen. So as we start to drift down this value scale here, our blending is going to happen by the amount of pressure that we put on the pen and the amount of overlap. So we can overlap and start to get more of a nine on the value scale to happen. So that means it's almost as dark as the solid 10 black, but there's a little bit of paper peeking through. So it's not an absolute black, right? And then our eight would be blended out from there by overlapping a little less, letting some other paper peek through. You're, you get the idea. And then I'm just going to jump down here to my five and do kind of like an evenly spaced pressure and evenly spaced lines to get my five on the value scale, maybe a little bit more than that. And then we, you know, go somewhere in the middle to connect those. And then our four, three, two, one on the value scale, we're using even less pressure. So maybe use the tip of the pen more than the, the side of it and start to let your lines space out even more and maybe start to disappear. So we get what's called implied lines. And we've talked about that before. We've talked about it a lot over the years. I'm gonna be revisiting that soon in some classes coming up in uh, December. I've got a fun little review of implied line that I'm planning right now for December. Okay, so we're looking for somewhere, we're meeting somewhere in the middle with these. Your, like I said, your value scale does not have to be perfect. I just want you to get a general idea of what hatching is. So that's our zero to 10 for the hatching. And I find it's very challenging to stay going one direction with my lines. Like I often, if I'm doing a drawing and I'm trying to just keep it to hatching, it's very hard to not wanna go back over it and do what's called cross hatching. So cross hatching is where we have multiple directional lines overlapping in all directions. So they might just be going vertical and horizontal, or maybe we've got some diagonal lines coming in there. Maybe you've got diagonal lines going the other direction. So it really doesn't matter. They can be going all different directions if you want them to for cross hatching. But the main idea is that they are overlapping until we get to that solid black in the, the 10 value here. And then less pressure on our pen. Sometimes I like to just go ahead and like drag it all the way down the value scale with the cross hatching because it's you're going to find as we go through these shading techniques, some of them take a little bit more focus and others you can do them a little more mindlessly and they can they go a little faster. So cross hatching, I feel like goes a little faster because we can easily cover up any unintentional marks that we might make. I try not to say mistakes because there's really no such thing as a mistake. There's just an unintentional mark, right? Uh, but yeah, we can cover up those unintentional marks a little easier. We can go a little faster with the cross hatching, et cetera. Okay, so we're just looking for some kind of blend in the way that we're letting things overlap. I think it's easier to start out dark and get lighter with your pressure on your pen. Uh, some people think it's easier to start out on the light side and then slowly build on the pressure and the overlapping with your pen. So the more you practice these shading techniques, the more you'll start to get the hang of your personal preference with how to blend them out. But again, we're not looking for a perfect perfect value scale here. We just want a general idea. And then we want to leave some blank space for the zero and start to like taper off and have more of an implied line for the uh, 
know, the lighter values, the like one, two, three on the value scale. All right, stippling is one that takes a lot of time and patience and pressure. So, uh, or not pressure, a variation in pressure. So it's just one dot at a time. And if you try to rush this one, sometimes people can try to rush it and they start to get these little bang dots happening on the page. Like they start to feel more like little slash marks. We want to try not to do that for two reasons. One, because it starts to just look a little messy. And the beautiful thing about stippling is how um, elegant it can look when it's done very thoughtfully. Oh, and I forgot to show my cross hatching example here for the cross hatching. So we'll do this together in just a moment. Uh, but the stippling can be very elegant when it's done you know, nice and slow. And then the other reason to not go too quickly and start to get those bang dots is it can mess up the nib of your pen, especially with a brush tip uh, pen like this that can, you know, ruin it and make it not work the way you want it to. So it's definitely a time consuming thing to do. When I teach this in person, my joke is always, all right, if you're having trouble sleeping later, you can finish your stippling value scale because if we were to sit here and do this entire value scale together we would easily take up the entire hour or maybe more of the class so it's just one dot at a time and I'm going to at least try to get my a little uh, sliver of a 10 value to happen here just so that we can see how much patience is involved in getting to an absolute 10 with no, no paper peeking through. So this is the easiest of the shading techniques, the pen and ink shading techniques to manipulate because it is just one dot at a time. So it's much easier to control each mark that you're making when you're only making one dot at a time, but it's very time consuming and it takes a lot of patience. So if you're very impatient for results, then stippling is maybe not going to be your favorite, but maybe the more you do it, you might start to love it. I am so patient when it comes to art practices and even art teaching. I find myself being a very patient person, but if you asked like my partner, how patient am I? He would probably laugh and say, I'm one of the most impatient people he knows. But I'm like, well, as an art teacher and as an artist, I'm very patient. So I've got that going for me. But my point is, someone said to me, patience isn't something you are, it's something you practice. And I was like, oh, I love that. So you might think, oh, I'm too impatient for stippling. That's one of those you know, self-defeating lines that's like, you can't learn patience. And I disagree and say, we can learn patience. We just need to practice it, right? So the more you practice stippling, maybe the more patient with it you will become. But I will say, having said how patient I am in art making, I have gotten more impatient over the years with results, stippling used to be my jam. It used to be my favorite thing to do. And now uh, I probably do more scribbling and cross hatching than any of the, the others. Uh, so that brings me to scribbling. So I'm gonna skip over the rest of stippling. You can go back and, you know, even evenly spaced, um, let them taper off, let them kind of disappear for the lighter pressure. And then you wanna meet somewhere in between this uh, absolute black and this mid-tone stippling, uh, you know, to get your full value scale. So you can finish that on your own. And then, yeah, the one that I love as a more impatient for results kind of person sometimes is uh, scribbling. So a scribble can be anything, right? It can be, so a random mark or a scribble, it can be more of like a loop-de-loop -loop scribble. Maybe you do your scribbles kind of more like boxes or squares or a little more angular, totally fine. There's not one way to scribble or it could be a letter, it could be a random mark, it could be anything. So like the letter E over and over again. But whatever you're doing, you're looking for the value in the object, the amount of darker light that is visible in the object, and you're filling in 
that shape, that value shape with this value shading technique. So if you're doing hatching, you're filling it in with those one directional lines. If you're doing cross hatching, you're doing multiple directional lines. If you're doing stippling, you're doing the dots. And if you're scribbling, you're finding that shape of the shadow and you're filling it in until you get to whatever value on the value scale you're going for. So for the 10 value, we're overlapping those scribbles until we get to a solid 10. And then I like to just scribble this all the way down my scale and just get lighter and lighter pressure down here. And then again, find the, the mid-tone, the blend. And we blend by overlapping, pulling up on our pressure on the pen. Or if you're going the opposite way, you start with a lighter pressure and then you build on your pressure as you, you go down the value scale. And, you know, just take a moment off to the side maybe and just notice like if you're having a hard time with the pressure on your pen, try uh, using your entire arm. So I'm going to switch to my forward facing view for just a second here. If you're finding that you're getting the same amount of pressure on your pen every time, maybe the movement is coming from your wrist. I want you to think about the entire movement of your arm as you do this and then see if you can let up on the pressure and get some much lighter lines to happen. So those were the marks that I was making using my entire arm. You can also kind of hover over the page um, without putting the pen all the way down. Those are ways to really control the amount of pressure that you're putting on the pen. Uh, and then just for fun, let's take out the soft, the soft tip, um, cause that was the hard tip and use the, the side of it. The soft tip really lends itself to using the, the side of the brush pen and see how thick of a line you can make when you're going down the side of the, the soft tip, using it parallel to the paper and then uh, use your entire arm and use the tip of that pen and see how thin of a line you can get. So you can really manipulate the uh, kind of mark that you're making with these pens, depending on how much pressure you're putting on them. And this is the hard tip. So the soft tip definitely can get us a thicker line. And we probably could have played with that a little bit more with our hatching and cross hatching to get those uh, darker values to happen. But I honestly just forgot because I was using the hard tip, the soft tip, I immediately turn it on its side. So that's the, the good, you know, the best way to, to use the, the two of these pens together. All right, so let's go back to these limes. Are there any questions about those shading techniques that we're about to use here? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. All right, thank you, Jasmine said that really helps. So glad to hear it. Okay, so going back to our first photo. Oh wait, that's the, that looks like the last lime. Yep, going back to our first photo of our lime here from last week. We already did the, the heavy lifting by putting all these contour lines on there for ourselves. So if you missed that, um, you can still stick around with us, but definitely make sure you check out last week's class to see what you missed in uh, how we mapped out these contours for ourselves. So the value is going to follow these contours. It's going to hug the side of the, of the lime, the shadow uh, the, that we see falling across the, the table underneath the lime, our value is going to be going a little more straight there. So we've got straight lines. So we're just following these guidelines that we created for ourselves, our, our lovely lime work, as someone was saying last week, instead of line work, I loved the, the lime puns. Uh, okay, so let's just get in there and get started. I'm going to use the hard tip pen uh, for most of this, but if you want to, you know, kind of go back and forth between the, the soft tip and the, the hard tip, 
I'm just afraid if I use the soft tip too much, I'm going to go a little too dark with it since it is just softer. Um, but maybe, you know what, since we talked so long already about the, the other stuff, maybe let's use the soft tip for the, uh, the darker value and then we can switch. Okay. So the darkest value, let's just go straight to the 10 on the value scale here, is here underneath the lime and the shadow. But we want to keep our lines going one directional here. And the question that I get asked the most with these shading techniques is, uh, can you combine them? And of course you can. There's no such thing as the drawing police. You are not going to, there, there's no rule book when it comes to art. You're never breaking any rules because there are no rules. There are some quote unquote rules, right? And there's some, you know, standards and there's some things that are successful for representational drawing, which should not necessarily be held as the, the highest level of art, in my opinion. But, um, you know, even though we're teaching representational drawing right here, but my point is, there are no rules. You can always do whatever you want. You can obviously combine them. The only reason that I'm using them isolated like this is to just help you understand them and how to use them. Okay, so I'm, oops, I lost my image here. Now you're seeing my kid's adorable screensaver on this, this iPad. Okay, so we're using one directional lines. We're overlapping because we want a solid 10 here, but we're kind of pulling up on our pressure as we guide our patching lines down into the shadow. So we're just following the contours, which are flat across the shadow. And by the way, we're not going to completely fill in every value that we're seeing on these. So feel free to go a little further um, on any of these if you'd like. And I'm just letting my pen lines, I'm kind of using the side of this soft pen towards the, the lime itself so that I can let the overlapping create a 10 on the value scale here. So I'm going kind of very deliberately close to the edge here. And then right about here is where that value starts to lighten up. So now I'm just kind of letting those hatching lines spread out and using a little less pressure. We could actually switch to the hard tip now so that it's easier to get that lighter pressure to happen. All right. And then we're looking at the shadow on the lime to see where does it get to a, a 10 value. And it really doesn't, except for maybe right there at the edge. And I would put that more at like a nine on the value scale, but it's totally okay to exaggerate these uh, shading techniques a little bit. So, um, you know, if you're not seeing like high contrast, you can always exaggerate. So I'm going to start on this like horizontal axis here. And again, I'm just because it would be really easy to do some cross hatching since we have two, you know, a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. We've got our 3D, you know, contours on here, but we want to just pick one. So the one for me that makes the most sense is going horizontally because the value kind of hugs the, uh, the side going this way, but you could do the vertical ones too, if you'd like to try it the other direction. Uh, but I'm just following those curves as we laid out for ourselves already and just letting all of my hatching lines follow those contours. It's so cool. Like normally this kind of drives me nuts, but right now it's kind of cool how certain things that I do on my paper, like when I'm painting on Zoom, it kind of certain colors like get washed out. But right now it's like you can see my drawing, but as soon as I start putting that pen on there, it's like it kind of makes all my drawing lines disappear. It's kind of cool or frustrating depending on how you want to look at that. 
anyway, so I'm exaggerating the value over here on the, the close to the side and I forgot if I have the soft tip or the hard tip. I had the soft tip again, so I'm going to switch to the hard tip so I can get some lighter values to happen. And we outlined that little value that we were seeing that darkest shadow last week. So that was this line, I'll just go ahead and outline it just a little bit so it stands out since I did that in my other my other sketch here. And then we also outlined, so you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but I'm just going to kind of outline those other values. So we had the highlight, we had this sort of more of a mid-tone shadow, and then we had our darkest shadow. So we're just filling in our darkest shadow on all of these together. And then you're welcome to keep going and filling the rest of them in and taking your time in order to get all those lighter and lighter values to happen. Or you can just stick to what I'm doing with, with us tonight and then just leave it, leave it be. So that is just getting us started with, with the hatching. And yeah, if you want to go ahead and label that one hatching, you can. And we're going to go ahead and move on to the cross hatching together here. So switch to our other lime view. And so we're really just focusing on these darkest shadows, like I said, but we'll outline those lighter values and then you're welcome to, to keep going if you have more time to finish these on your own. So I'll just go ahead and outline that highlight that I was seeing. And I think I outlined like a couple of little imperfections, like some little bruisey moments that were happening on, on this view. And then we had that darkest shadow here. All right, so let's start in the, the darkest part of the shadow. And this one is definitely, it, it always feels like the restraints are lifted a little bit when you go from hatching to cross hatching, but of course you can always combine them unless maybe you're in an art class where your teacher is grading you on just using hatching on a drawing. I guess that would be the one time when you want to stick to just one. Or if you want to challenge yourself to just stick to hatching in a drawing. But I find it's very tricky to just stick to that one directional uh, line. Okay, so this time I'm kind of circling that uh, that shape that we defined for ourselves last week, that little you know, you can actually see it in the in the photo itself, that little ring that's happening, uh, little three different values that are showing up in the in the shadow there. So I was outlining that one and then now go in the other direction and getting those flat lines and we kind of put a little radiating hatching line in here last week when we were putting our value in there a little bit with our pencil. So we can follow that same path. And yeah, if it gets a little funky and weird, like I kind of lost the perfect radiation that was happening there a little bit, that's when you can just go over it the other direction and kind of camouflage something. And you could even get, you know, some, some other directional lines here. The main uh, thing you want to keep in mind with this is just, you know, if you're kind of going crazy with your lines going all different directions, just make sure they're all coming in pretty straight because we've got already got this curved line here for the shadow. If we were to curve anything else, it might start to confuse the viewer and make them think they were looking at something that's not flat. So we don't want to curve things too much that it starts to feel three-dimensional here. So 
but you could even radiate those out a little bit more, whatever you want to do. Um, but basically, we're just filling in that shadow with a little less and less pressure. And then I'm going to leave the little navel here alone so it's still kind of visible against that shadow. I kind of left it light. I might put just like a tiny bit of some cross hatching on it here. And we broke that shape down, you know, like this. You can see like the, the cross hatching that you might add to that if you wanted to. Uh, all right. And then now we're just following our contours again. I'm going to switch back to that hard tip. And again, I'm really not seeing like an absolute 10 on the, the value scale here on the lime right here, but we can always exaggerate it and make it a little darker if we want. But yeah, having these contours sketched out like this makes it pretty easy to see where we need to put all these hatching and cross hatching lines. It might get a little trickier when we get to the, the stippling and scribbling. But with this, we've got both of our cross contours are completely mapped out for us, right? Because we've got these going this other direction and then we've got the curved lines giving us the roundness on this side. So the main thing we need to keep in mind is that we are trying to fill in this value shape that we're seeing with the appropriate value. So it, it's pretty dark here. There's maybe shapes within shapes of shadows here. We've got the darkest shadow closest to the navel. And then I kind of lumped this whole dark shadow all in together. But there is definitely, you know, it goes from like a, a nine or a 10 to maybe like a seven or an eight here at the edge. So that's where we want to let our pressure kind of come up a little bit as we move into the rest of this shadow. We don't want the, you know, the kind of tail ends of the shadow to be just as dark as the beginning of it. But essentially, we're we're filling in this whole shadow here with a similar value. And if you want to kind of blend out into the rest of the lime a little bit by just, you know, getting more of like a mid-tone value to happen here or noticing like some moments where it gets a little dark in the middle, you know, feel free to finish getting in here and, and adding even more value to all of these. But I'm going to go ahead and stop there with the cross hatching and move on to stippling. Since that one's going to take us a little bit more time than the other. So I wanted to give us at least a good 10 minutes for the, the stippling here. So we'll go ahead and label this one cross hatching. And the scribbling is going to go fast. So, but the stippling lime is going to take us a little extra time here, and we don't want to rush it. So, let me scoot this up a little. Okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and start off with the soft one here too. Although I really love, oh, we, we can still use the tip of the soft one. I just love going really slow and delicate with the stippling and just really letting it be as delicate and, you know, precious as it as it can be because it is just so elegant to keep using that word when you get it all in here nice and nice and slow all right so I'm just looking at my darkest shadow underneath the, the lime and yeah I really do like to start with the darkest values in almost everything that I do but um 
I say almost because I don't always, sometimes it's nice to start out light and then move, you know, build pressure and, and overlapping to the, the dark values. But I find starting in the darkest values and then letting up on your pressure to be a little easier for me. So figure out what works for you. But we can also, since we've got this soft tip, we can use the side of it and get a few little fatter uh, dots to happen and start to fill in, you know, that shadow a little faster. But again, with this method, I think going slowly is is the move and not rushing it and not trying to cut corners you know like some people always get like really excited when they're like oh I could just use like a really you know thick marker or you know and I can make this tippling go faster and I'm like all right if you want to but I think there's something so beautiful about letting all those little dots uh add up because even just then, when I kind of used the side of the pen, I feel like I lost some of the magical qualities that I was getting there. So it's an option. You can do it. But I think building that 10 on the value scale through focused stippling is going to have a, a, a much more satisfying result in my opinion that's just my opinion okay so it's going to take us some time now that we're letting up on our pressure a little bit here and letting them spread out to fill in this large area so that's why we're just sticking to our our darkest shadows for these is because this one's going to take so long and yeah, the faster you go, you definitely can go a little bit faster than I was doing at first, but, you know, just be mindful of the pressure that you're putting on there if you're doing that. Since this is so tedious and takes so much time, I kind of don't have anything else to say about it. Um, so I'm just going to quietly stipple for a minute here. Do you all have any thoughts you want to share about these shading techniques so far, you can drop them in the chat. Um, someone's asking, when would you use all the techniques and values on an art form? Anytime you want, you can use all of them. Um, Robert saying, you see these techniques a lot in traditional comics and illustration. Yes, that's true. Yeah, anywhere you're seeing pen and ink work, you're gonna see these shading techniques. Um, also, you'll see them a lot in printmaking, since a lot of etching, woodworking, or sorry, not woodworking, um, relief printmaking, wood blocks, lino cuts, all that stuff. You've got to make one mark at a time, so you can't use the more, you know, soft blended tonal shading that you might get with a graphite pencil or charcoal, etc. You can't you know, do that smooth, continuous blend that way, but you can carve out one mark at a time or you're etching with a, with a dry point onto a, a, you know, a copper plate or a plexiglass plate, depending on what type of uh, etchings you're doing. You have to use one mark at a time, just like with a pen, so. Whenever I teach a pen and ink drawing class, I often will bring in, um, uh, you know, books of different engravings and etchings. And I actually, I have one right here on my shelf. I'll just have a little art history moment and show you some really gorgeous, these are engravings by Hogarth. 101. Print. I found this on the web. Oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> I activated Siri somehow. Uh, so yeah, all of these are engravings that are done with one mark at a time, right? Look at that drapery, all that hatching and cross-hatching that went into that. So 
that's really fun to look at. All right, back to the stippling. All right, that's probably enough for the shadow. We're getting the idea, right, for how to get it on a flat surface to, to go out in that direction. All right, so now let's look at our little center of our navel here on the lime. And we had all these little guidelines for ourselves. I'm just gonna go ahead and outline this little starburst pattern here that kind of radiated out in all directions. And I have to say, breaking this particular lesson up into two like this, it really makes it so easy that we took the time that we did on this, uh, the cross contour lines last week to be able to go back in now and add the value and to have all of it already mapped out like this. It's definitely my favorite way to draw is to do all the leg work and to paint. When I paint too, do all the leg work at the beginning of the process, that way the process itself can just be a little more mindless. Um, okay, so we're looking at these this kind of inner shadow that's happening inside of our little starburst pattern. And the most this is where we're going to put the darkest values is inside of our little starburst pattern, except for right inside of here, you know, in that part. Um, there's some like more solid value happening inside of there and you can stipple those that in as well but mostly I'm just doing my dots doing my stippling dots to fill in this darker value and I'm following those contours so it'd be really easy here it'd be really easy in any drawing to just kind of start to fill in the, the value and to not necessarily follow the contour lines. But when you do, it makes such a difference in making something look and feel uh, three-dimensional. So making sure that our stippling is kind of radiating out in this starburst pattern. And it's hugging all those contours. All right, I said 10 minutes for the stippling and we've already been stippling for 10 minutes. I might have to let y'all, maybe let's do scribbling and then we'll come back to stippling if we've got some time left over. I wanna make sure we get to all of them or you can start to like drift out of the starburst a little bit and go ahead and start to drift up the side of our, our shadow here. I'll go ahead and outline this darker shadow that we're, Focusing on for the, the darkest stippling. Something like that. So this is that darkest value, but it's definitely going to take some time to fill all of that in. Okay, let's move on to scribbling and then we'll come back to it. Even with saving the most time for it, it's still just takes so much time. All right, so our last lime, this one will go quick. We're just looking at those darkest values. I'll go ahead and outline them again a little bit here. So this darkest shadow, although again, I'm kind of lumping what starts as maybe a nine on the value scale and then fades into like, you know, a seven or an eight on the tail end of it. I'm lumping all of that into to one value here. And the navel itself does get a little bit darker here. But let's do that shadow underneath first. So we're just scribbling, but it's a controlled scribble. I feel like when people really struggle to see what I mean about value shapes, when we get to scribbling, it's usually not always, but it starts to click in that like, oh, okay, I'm filling in this value shape with this technique because you can see it so quickly how we're filling in that shape 
with a value and we're using the scribbling value, but we're still filling in this value shape. It's one of those things that just takes a lot of practice to see what I mean by a value shape. It's an organic shape of a shadow or the shape of the light. Okay, so kind of fading with our pressure and our overlapping, but still following our contours, which are flat, but then curving a little bit inside of this shadow. And yeah, this one goes the fastest, but I think it takes the most skill to be able to do it quickly with still following the contours. So we're following those contours. It's a lot easier to slowly follow those contours with the other techniques. But with this one, we have to be mindful that we are following that shape as we gently wrap around these contours. And yeah, we're gonna fill it in pretty quick. But we can go back and maybe add like a few other, maybe come into the mid-tones a little bit, bit since this one goes so quickly. And I always joke that it has taken me years to be able to carelessly scribble in a way that looks nice and cool like that. It's like a person who takes five hours to plan an outfit to make it look like they just threw it on in five minutes. It's taken me years of scribbling to be able to scribble nice and quickly like that and make it look, look all, all cool. So don't compare your scribbling. You can also do any other random mark if it helps you control it and go a little bit slower. All right, let's see. The 54 mark, I think we can go back and do a little bit more stippling together for two more minutes. Oh my God. Oh, I thought I started to write the wrong word. All right, so we got stippling and scribbling. Let's go back to our stippling for a couple minutes here. And this is something that is really nice to do, like sitting on the couch in front of the TV. If you feel like you're not getting enough art practice in on a, a daily basis, maybe give yourself a few sketches like this in your sketchbook ahead of time and then get your pens out and sit on the couch and just start filling in your values with some stippling because you can kind of really go into a mindless place with this. It's so meditative. And if you're just, you know, filling in a certain area, one dot at a time, you can easily kind of go into autopilot doing this and you don't have to think about it too much as long as you've, you know, outlined where you want it to go ahead of time, then you don't have to think about it. Or you could just stipple, you know, patterns to practice. Again, there are no rules. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I'll switch back to this other one for a second so I can be like a cooking show. I went on a much smaller scale last time too, so. That definitely helped to be able to fill this in a little faster. I drew really big last week because I was trying to make my drawing show up on the screen easily. So, but I didn't think about how much longer it would take to fill it all in. Hey, Adrian. Yeah. I have a question for you. Um, when the values of the subject and its shadow are the same, how do you prevent them from blending? Oh, okay. Good question. Um, really just stick to your contours and have faith in, in your viewer that your viewer is going to make that separation in understanding that this is the shadow that's being cast across the table and this is the lime itself. Um, yeah, it's just about following the contours on the 
you know, on the, those two things, like let's say it's a, a leaf on a tree, how do you separate the branch from the leaf? And it would be, well, the contours are gonna be different on the leaf, the shapes that are covering the leaf are gonna be a little different than the branch. And, um, you know, giving your viewer, the person who's, who's viewing your art, the benefit of the doubt of knowing that they're gonna, they're gonna be clever. People are clever when they're looking at things with their eyes. We are always looking for patterns in what we see. So, you know, if you're sticking to the contours and those value shapes, uh, and it still looks confusing to you, then I don't know. I don't know what to say. I think maybe drawing it again, trying it again, and then that time, like really, fo I think following the contours will make all the difference. Because like right there, I can see how that maybe could happen where the shadow starts to like bleed into the object a little too much there. I also did leave a tiny bit of like space at the edge so that you could see the edge. But even if I covered up that edge, I still think we would read it as that's where the lime stops and that's where the, the shadow starts. Uh, good question though. Okay, let's switch. Let's switch back to my forward facing view. I'd love to see some of y'all's sketches if you wanna hold them up and uh, Chanel can spotlight you and can see some of your your limes and all your value oh look at that gorgeous value emma i love it yes you're being so delicate with all of your application of all of those shading techniques that's lovely i think being very delicate like that too being very like just focused um with your lines that's not to say that if your lines are kind of loose and messier that it's a bad thing but I think if you can, if you, if you put it where your eyes are above it, I think it'll show again. If you put your art. Oh, put it underneath your eyes. Like put your eyes, like put, hold it. Like, yeah. 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 Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I can see you're really following those, those contour lines with all the, the shading value. I know those backgrounds are, are so tricky. Oh yeah, look at those. That's nice and crisp and clear. Very nice. I love how your stippling is, it's got such an interesting, all of your shading techniques have such an interesting stylized quality happening there. All right, let's see. Oh, look at that delicate stippling on that one and very nice. Yeah, I think you did it too. They're having that little uh, kind of blank space between the shadow and the line. That That's a great way to separate the... And sometimes like in a lot of diagrams of value, they'll leave that like little light, uh, reflective light moment, but not everything shows that reflective light, but putting it in there anyway is still a nice way to to separate things. Really lovely. All right, look at that one. Ooh, that one with your hatching up there is like, you really made it glow with your, your value on that one. And that scribbling is really nice too. All right. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I can tell you're using like a really nice thick, maybe a brush pen, because you're able to get those. Maybe not, but... Well, I was using a brush pen too, but you did a great job of like feathering out your your value on that hatching, especially it really feels nice and softly blended. Oh, and the stippling too. I'm really feeling those three-dimensional cross contour lines. Let's see. Yeah, that's so lovely. I love how you had that separation between your your different value shapes and that kind of subtle shift between each one. That's a really neat effect. Oh, look at that one. 
Oh, that is just lovely. I hope some of you will share these with me on social media or even just share them with me personally. You could, I love seeing examples like that. That is just like a textbook example right there. And I like how you wrote side one and side two, diagonal, top, Jasmine. I love it. I am in love with that. Just gorgeous. All right, let's see. All right, yeah. Ooh, look at that hatching one. It's really well defined. Really your three dimensional, and your stippling's off to such a great start. And your scribbling has such a nice stylized quality. I think it's Jasmine. A. I think I said it wrong. Thank you. That was so lovely. And this is C and M. Love it. And now we've got Vina. Oh, that's gorgeous too. Wow, y'all did such an amazing job. That hatching is so lovely. Really well defined. All right. Yeah, there's another great example. Y'all did such an amazing job tonight. I'm so impressed. All right, I wish we could look at more of them, but I just realized we went three minutes over. So I want to respect everybody's time. Thank you all so much for such a wonderful class. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you next week for that two-part class where we'll be starting to make our little moonscape. It's very Halloween themed without being super Halloween themed. So thank you all. See you soon. Have a good night.